mysteries of the network. Uh, so let me remind you uh, the architectures and some of the questions that we raised about these networks. So the architecture is here. You have your image, which is transformed by a linear operator and a non-linearity, which can be uh, a rectifier or an absolute value. And the nature of these linear operators is that they are convolution operators in the sense that the output here is going to be produced by a filter that performs a convolution on the image. So you have your covariance to translation. But it also does that to each image of the layer. And it sums out recombined. Of course, I'm speaking here of images. It can be signal. It doesn't have to be uh, necessarily uh, images. And then you cascade that up to the last layer where you have a final uh, linear combination and uh, uh, max, uh, potentially uh, a logistic classifier. And all kind of questions that we raise, why convolution? That's because of the nature of translation covariance that you have in many of these problems. And in fact, in variance, if you have an object, when you translate the object, uh, it won't change the nature of the object. You want to reflect that in your uh, resulting representation. Uh, why no overfitting? One of the important reasons that we mentioned is that uh, this nonlinear operator is going to be a contraction. And the linear operators are going to have also a uh, uh, type of contraction properties, meaning that they are going to reduce the dimensionality uh, of the space. So it's not because you have a lot of parameters within these operators that, that uh, they are not going to reduce uh, their image. Uh, so that's essentially the component of uh, non overfitting You don't expand the size of the space. You rather reduce it. And in fact, in many of the, ne of the networks, the last layers are much smaller uh, than the first layer. Now, there are many questions which are much less clear. So, why do you need to have a hierarchical cascade as opposed to a single layer network, which is a question that constantly comes back? Why introducing what is the role really of these uh, non linearities? Uh, we've seen that there is a type of linearization phenomenon that I'll come back to it. Uh, what is the nature and how does it appear? And what's really the role of all these channels? What is the role of these linear operators? OK, one way uh, to look at this problem that I mentioned, we're going to begin with uh, simpler architecture. This simpler architecture is not going to take each output image as a combination of all the images, but each image is going to come out from a single image. In other words, in this architecture, you basically split images an image is going to be split into multiple images, which will be again split. So in this case, uh, the linear operator here is a simple convolution. It's a convolution with a filter, which depends upon the output image and on the input image. And you have exactly the same nonlinearity. So in that sense, I'm going to uh, simplify uh, the architecture. And we're going to see how far we can go. So no communication between the different channels. And still the same question comes out. Why would it make sense to have a yard testing? Let me remind you a uh, few ideas from the previous lecture. Uh, we are going to build up a change of variable. The last layer can be viewed as a change of variable. You had an x, you have a phi of x. And finally, you are going to have a function which is going to be a combination of uh, this phi of x. Now, one way to view the problem geometrically is as follows. You have a function which defines classes through its level set. The level set of a set of x for which f of x is equal to t, so uh, let's say a particular class. In the original space, these classes have a completely wild behavior that is illustrated uh, over there. Linearizing means you would like to try to considerably regularize these level set up to hopefully, ultimately, make them parallel to linear space. Why you would like to do that? Because if you can do that, then you can reduce dimensionality and therefore fight against the curse of dimensionality. Our main problem in all these high-dimensional uh, questions is that 
the volume of the space is huge. So we need to reduce the volume of the space so that the limited number of samples that we have can make a relatively dense sampling of the space that we're going to consider. So initially the space is too big, all points are completely far away one from the other. If you reduce the volume of the space, you can arrive to a relatively dense sampling. To reduce the volume of the space, you essentially need to do some form of dimensionality reduction. Now, if you linearize the level sets, if you project, then you can reduce the dimensionality of the space, but the main difficulty is to linearize first these uh, level sets. Now, difficult because these level sets are very correct. Now, how can you describe the geometry of the level set? As I explained, you cannot describe this geometry, this, this geometry locally. You cannot describe it locally because you have very few points locally. In fact, you have no points, just one point. You don't access things such as curvature and so on. However, you can look at the global geometry of this level set. And how do you define the global geometry? You try to define sets of operators that will be groups which preserve this level set. What does that mean? That means that if you have a point in a level set, if you move with one of the elements of the group, you are going to remain in the level set. So here I just move with a single operator G1, and I again move with G1 and so on. The specific thing is that these movements are going to be completely wild in the original space, and if you begin from two points, you are going to have extremely irregular trajectory. So if you do any linear projection of this, it's going to be a mess. You are going to mix the different classes and so on. So what you would like, as I said, is to find a change of variable which is going to regularize this wild behavior. Regularize so that hopefully they are now going to belong to very regular curve. And if that's the case, then you can do locally linear projection that will reduce the dimensionality without mixing your levels. And the condition for that is that when you move from one point to the other with an operator within your level set, with an operator of your symmetry group, then you need that in the feature space, in the phi space, the movement is very regular. And this regularity is expressed here is the fact that if you move from phi of x to phi of x moved by g, then this distance should be of the order of the size of the movement of the size of the operator g, which obviously has to be defined for each of the two. So that's the kind of thing, and the claim is that it looks like deep networks are able to do that, and in fact, they can do something that looks even more spectacular, is that even though you don't know in advance the group, they found out the geometry of these level sets from the data. And that's an example that I show. Translation is a simple operation, but if you look at the set of diffeomorphism that I showed last time, you can really have a very wild travel across images. And you can see that when the diffeomorphism is small, the image essentially remains of the same class, and at one point when it's too big, then the image is going, obviously going to change because you can transform, uh, let's say, a 3 into a 5 with a diffeomorphism. So, what we're going to try to do is to take this diffeomorphism and try to make a change of variable that is going to linearize them locally, so that local small diffeomorphisms are going to behave almost as a linear operator in our change of variable space. If you can do that, then you can kill the uh, diffeomorphism that do not put you in a different class by a simple linear projection. The question is how to do that. And what I'm going to show is that you can do that with a deep network. In fact, if you want to do that, you are naturally led to a deep network architecture. Okay, so the two properties that I'm going to impose, translation, you want to be completely invariant to translation. 
So, or at least locally. So that means that if u is translated phi of u, uh, sorry, x is translated, phi of x translated should be the same than phi of x. Now, diffeomorphism. As I said, a diffeomorphism is, consists in taking the image x and translate it by an amount, each point u is translated by an amount that depends upon u. So the fact that tau now depends upon u means that you can have squeezing or dilation uh, effect. The amount of variation of a distance in the plane, image plane, is at most by a factor maximum value taken by the Jacob that you can verify. And that's what is the definition of a weak uh, metric over diffeomorphism. So that's the size of the diffeomorphism. So, what we want is that if an image is deformed, you would like that in your feature space, after the change of variable, the increment is of the order of the maximum value that the Jacobian uh, of the deformation uh, can take. And finally, as I had mentioned in the first course, obviously, you still want to be discriminative. You don't want to mix classes, so you always want that if you take two point x and x prime such as f of x minus f of x prime is different, two different classes, you want that the change of variable doesn't mix the two classes, so the distance should be bigger than a certain constant multiplied by uh, the difference between f of x and f of x prime. Okay, so we've seen last time that the obvious mathematical tools to do that doesn't work, which is the Fourier transform. I also explained last time that multiscale is a very important element in order to be able to reduce the complexity of problem by factorizing them across scale. That's used all over science, in particular in physics and mathematics. And one tool to do that are wavelengths. So we are very naturally going to to see appear, reappearing these wavelengths. And I'm going to show that you can build up a deep network with these wavelengths, which essentially solves these first problems. And we'll look at applications to image, audio classification, generation of textures, and models of random processes. Then we'll look at the limitation of that type of model. And the main limitation is that the channel do not communicate. And the fact that the channel do not communicate means that you essentially only work on the translation variable. So you can only deal with groups which are based on translation. What if you want to be invariant to rotation, scaling, or much more complex group? Then you need to have the channel communicate. And we'll see how we can make them communicate in order to be invariant to other type of groups. And that will be the second part and the, the other ideas, and we'll see that this is also very important in image and in audio classification. I'll then look application to physics and to quantum chemistry, and I'll show in what sense you can learn uh, quantum physics directly from data without any prior, uh, almost no prior knowledge on physics. The only prior knowledge that we're going to use are global symmetry properties. And I'll finish on open problems. Uh, and as I said, in this field, most problems are open. What I'm going to try to do between yesterday and today is rather give you direction in which the research moves, the type of tools and mathematics that are involved, and then it's up to you to, if you're interested, to really try to tackle the problem. Okay, so what's the difference between a wavelet and a sine wave? The problem of a sine wave is that it's completely delocalized. And if you slightly dilate a sine wave, small deformation, you get a sine wave of different frequency which is orthogonal to itself. That means that they are completely different. To avoid that, we're going to take a localized sine wave. So a localized sine wave is a wave, something like this. We're going to squeeze these wavelets or dilate them. So that's the same wavelet which is squeezed. How do, so a wavelet is a function like that. In fact, in our case, it will very often be a complex function. 
And what you do is you take your complex function, you dilate it. It can be by a factor 2 to the j, or it can be by smaller dilation factor, in which case you're going to have q wavelets per octave. Okay? So these are the wavelets. And then you are going to take your signal x, and you're going to filter the signal, so make a convolution. And a convolution can be viewed as an inner product with the wavelet, which is try to translate it at the position t. So you take your wavelet, you translate it all over. Now, if you look at that in the Fourier domain, a convolution is a product. So the Fourier transform of a convolution at the frequency omega is a Fourier transform of x multiplied by the Fourier transform of the filter, of the wavelet. So obviously you would like to know how the wavelets look like. Now, how does the wavelet look like? In the Fourier domain, this is an oscillatory function, zero average. It's a band path solver, shown here. It only covers one frequency band. When you dilate a function in the spatial domain, you also dilate it by the inverse factor in the Fourier domain. So if you dilate it, this towards higher frequencies, you are going to get this function, this function. If you uh, dilate it in the spatial domain, it's going to squeeze it in the Fourier domain, you're going to get this function. And you see you cover the whole frequency domain with your filters. These are very classical tools in signal processing called Q-constant filter band. And I will also have a low-pass filter. Think of that as an averaging filter, like a Gaussian. And what is a wavelet transform? You just take your x, you decompose it on each of these frequency channels by making a convolution with each of the wavelets. And you may keep also the average of x by doing a convolution with the low-pass filter, which is here. Okay? So you basically separate the average from all the different frequency channels carried by each of the wavelets. And if you cover well all your frequency axes with all the filters, you can easily verify with a Planchel formula that the sum of the energy of all these coefficients, which is the norm of the wavelet uh, vector, will give you back the norm of the signal. Okay, so all this is linear and simple to uh, analyze. Now, why wavelet? One of the very important properties of the wavelet is that if you deform a wavelet, because it's localized, it's going to look like itself. And in fact, you can easily verify that if you take a wavelet, you deform it by a factor tau, the distance is going to be bounded by the maximum size of the deformation. So the wavelets are stable to deformation. Sine waves are not, but wavelets are stable. Another thing is, they separate in different frequency channels, different scales. And we saw that this is going to be important to structure the information. Last important thing, it sparsifies many signals. That means that it transforms a signal that potentially has many non-zero values in coefficients which are very sparse. And that's something that plays an important role also. Okay. So let's see an example. Take a signal which is piecewise regular, like this one. You take a wavelet and you move it all along, and a convolution just consists in computing at each position the correlation. If you do that, the response is going to be sparse, because here the output will be nearly zero, because the wavelet oscillates. But where you have a sharp discontinuity, the transition is large, so you get a large response. Here you have another one, and so on. That's a wavelet transform, okay? And you do that at all scale. So as I said, this is classic. It has been used all over since uh, the 80s. Here, you see the same thing for an audio signal. This is an audio signal. This is the time. This is the frequency, central frequency, that I call lambda of the wavelength, the position along its frequency axis. And each line here, corresponds to the modulus of the convolution of x with the wavelet. And what you see is whenever the wavelet has the frequency of the harmonic of the signal, you have a strong response. And you see how, as a function of time, you see appearing the harmonics of the different musical notes that you had in your signal. Okay? So this is called a scalogram or spectrogram, and that gives you an equivalent like a musical uh, uh, chord, uh, sorry, score. Okay, 
Now, how can you build something which is translation invariant from a wavelet transform? And there, problem speaking. If you want to be translation invariant relatively to any group, but let's look at the uh, translation group here, and you want to be linear, then you don't have the choice. The only thing that you can do is to average along the orbit. In this case, it means averaging the function locally in space or in time. If you average, you are going to get a very regular function. Here I get a local average. And as a consequence, this regular function, if you translate it a little bit, looks like itself. This is going to be OK as long as the translation is smaller than the averaging domain. If you want to be fully translation invariant, that's what you get. You get a constant. This is translation invariant. But obviously, big problem, you've lost all the information. That's the problem when you compute invariant. You want to make sure to compute invariant, but still preserve information. OK, so where is the information that you've lost? The information that you've lost are in the high frequencies that you've eliminated. So you can capture it by getting the high frequency as wavelet coefficient. How will the high frequency behave? So here I have a complex wavelet with a real part, imaginary part. So I basically have two wavelet transform with in a position of phase. The high frequency is going to oscillate at the speed of oscillation of the wavelet. If you take this and you average it, you get zero because the wavelet has a zero average. In other words, that's the only invariant that you can get if you stay there. If you want to have more invariant, you need to be non -net. Okay, so what you can do is exactly the same kind of thing that we did for the Fourier transform. Kill these oscillations, kill the phase. How? With a modulus. So the modulus comes as a very natural tool to do that. If you do that, you're going to get an analog. Now this is more regular, so that's good. But still, the analog is going to vary quite a lot. And if x is translated, the envelope is going to be translated. So this is not translation invariant. How can you make it translation invariant? You can average. Let's average. There you get a new set of invariants for all frequency lambda. But the problem is that you've lost information. What is the information you've lost? The high frequencies. How can you recover the information you've lost? filter and get the high frequency. In other words, you take your envelope and you convolve with a new wavelet. You compute the Fourier, the wavelet transform, sorry, of this envelope. So that means you take your envelope and you filter it with wavelet again. And you take the modulus and you will continue. And what we're building here is a convolution network with linear filters, Modulus, linear filters, modulus, linear filters, modulus. If you want, you can replace your modulus here with a rectifier. If you average the output of a rectifier, you get essentially the same result. That's how electronic circuits are built on. If you replace modulus by rectifiers, that gives you the same kind of result. In this case, what is the second layer going to give you? You see here, you have the response of the wavelet, but if you want something translation invariant, you are going to kill all this by averaging it. So you don't know anymore where are the peaks. You've lost the geometry. The second order coefficients, they are going to send new waves that are going to make these things interact. They are going to build up interferences, and that's going to give you a coefficient that will memorize the geometry of your structures. Yes? You may do the full translation invariance, if you want. It depends upon the problem. You'll have a, part, a free parameter, which is how much translation invariance you want. But you can make it, in some of the examples that I show, like for example in quantum chemistry, we'll use something completely translation invariant. Textures also. Let me show you an example with uh, images with sound. Vibrato, okay? That would be the wavelet coefficient. You see the harmonic and the different sound. 
if you average out, because you want something translation invariant, and I average out here on 100, uh, 500 milliseconds, you see how after averaging, they all look the same. So basically, you've lost all the information which differentiate these structures. How can you recover it? You go along the line like that, and you make a convolution of this with a new wavelength. That's what we do in here. So you are going out of this line to get a whole new image. And now the second order coefficient average, now you have the information about the fact that the attack here was very weak. This was a high frequency attack, very sharp. Here you had a tremolo, and you see it by the fact that this envelope was oscillating, which you see by this ray. And here you had the vibrato, which has a different trace. So in the next layers, you see the information that you've lost. That's why it was so important to continue to have linear and nonlinear operators. If I view, show you that as a graph, in the original space, the only dimension that existed was time. Once you've done these linear operators, modulus, you've created a new dimension, which is a frequency dimension which is the index of your filter. And that's an image where now your layer lives. If you apply yet, uh, sorry, an averaging, because you want to be translation invariant, you lose all the time. And so you lose the localization, the geometry of the structure. How you recover it, as I said, each of these lines are going to be convolved with a new wavelength, and you create a two-dimensional uh, space for each of these. That's the second uh, order coefficient. If you average, you get that, and so on. What is important to remember from that is that as you go deeper and deeper, you create new axes, which represents different properties that were not explicit here. You represent a frequency property as one new axis, yet another axis which gives you interactions, and so on. Yes? So, here you are. Yes. Uh, to me, translation invariance just means that you have the same signal uh, translated in time and you can hold it with whatever. No, there's two things which are different covariance and translation invariance. Covariance means that if I do something here and it's a basically a commutation, it should have the same effect that uh, if I do it here. Invariance means I build up a representation which doesn't change if the signal changes. That means that, suppose I want a label. The label of this object is the same whether the object is here or here. So the representation has to be the same if it's x is here or here. So if you want to do that, that means that this cannot move anymore. The representation has to be exactly the same if this is here, here, here. If you want to do that with a linear operator, the only thing you can do is average like that which is not the same than a covariant representation. And a covariant representation, you get it with any convolution. A convolution is if you uh, do something like if you speak in a microphone, if you speak five seconds afterwards, the output will be delayed by five seconds. Okay, let me show you the same thing now for images. This is a wavelet in two dimensions. So it's basically, think of it as a Gabor function, a Gaussian modulated by a cosine wave here, and a sine wave to get the imaginary part. Now, in two dimensions, you are going still to scale your filters. So this is a wavelet, which is scaled, squeezed like that. But you are also going to rotate the wavelet. So this is a wavelet, which is now rotated. Okay, so you get a whole family of wavelet indexed by the size, the scale, and indexed by the orientation selectivity okay, of your wavelength. And then you do the same thing. Mathematically speaking, it's the same than in 1D. You just make a convolution with wavelength indexed by a parameter, which is just a correlation of the image with the wavelength which is going to be translated all over the image. So, in the Fourier domain, it's a product. A wavelet is a bandpass filter. It's going to cover one particular direction, and a set of frequencies. If you rotate it, it's going to cover a whole frequency analysis. If you dilate it, all the frequency analysis, and you're going to cover your whole frequency plane with these filters. 
As a consequence, if you now make a convolution of x with all the wavelengths, you're going to get all the frequency information about x. So this is going to be a complete representation. Okay, that's the low frequency and the high frequency across all our notations. And it's going to preserve energy. So formally, the mathematics are really exactly the same. You have a bunch of filters, they cover the frequency plane, they get you all the information of your signal, they are built with dilations. Now, there is something very important on the wavelengths, is that the way you compute these things is by cascading filters. And I'm going to illustrate that with a very simple wavelength, which is a hard wavelength. Let me begin with averaging. How can you average a signal if you want to do it efficiently and you want to get all the averages? Let's first average the pairs of points. Each pair of points is average, okay? So it's like building a piecewise constant signal. You just make average by pairs. And then if you want to average more, you take each of the pairs and you average them. And if you want to even average more, each of the pairs are average until the point that you average the last two points, you get that. So this is a cascade of averaging subsampling, averaging subsampling, averaging subsampling. That's how you can build the global average. Now, hard wavelength. If you make an average, you've lost information. You have two points, you got the average. What do you lose? The difference. Okay, let's get the difference. This is a different filter. It's a filter which is going to compute the difference between two consecutive points. If you have this and this, you can reconstruct this. In fact, it's an orthogonal change of basis. You just rotate the axis in two dimensions. Think of that as low-pass filter. It's an averaging. And that's the difference. This is a high-pass filter, high frequency. So you've split the information with a low-pass and a high-pass filter. Now let's view that as a graph. If you repeat that, you average, you can average again, extract the high frequency. Average again, extract high frequency. <laughs> this is a wavelength transform. What did you do? You cascaded averages, so at the bottom you have just an inner product of the convolution of your signal with an averaging at the different points. What do you get here? What you get here is a series of averaging and then a difference. Globally, you have a global filter. What is this global filter doing? An average here and here, and the differences of these two average, and that gets you an inner product with this function, which is called the Haar wave. And that's why all the wavelets, essentially, that's not just true for this one, can be constructed with these filter bank algorithms. That's called the fast wavelet transform, and it's even faster than the Fourier transform, a signals of size n can be computed with this filter bank with O of n operation. Now when you see that, obviously it reminds somewhere this deep net because you see these cascade of filters but they have something a bit different. And I'll come back to that. Let me do the same thing for an image. This is the average image and the only difference is now these are the bandpass filter. I'm going to have a real and imaginary part, two pairs of filters. And I don't have one bandpass filter because I'm in 2D, I want orientation. These are the different bandpass filters. And now I take the average and I repeat. And that's going to get me the wavelet coefficient at the next scale and the average. Now here at the output I've taken a modulus. But this is a positive function because this was a positive signal. I average it, it remains positive. To take the modulus doesn't change that, so I can forget the modulus here, okay? And I take this, I repeat, I split it, and I split it. And these are wavelet coefficients. You spread, you, you exploded your information in different orientations and scale, and observe, many of the coefficients are black, sparse representation. And another remark, if you have a coefficient which is positive, if you apply your nonlinearity, whether it's a rectifier or a modulus, you'll get exactly the same. You'll, you'll get the value root. So all the nonlinearity disappears here. Okay, so let me now show how you get a deep network out of that. What I explained is that if you do that, 
and you want a representation which is invariant, you're going to need to average this thing. But if you average this thing, you lose information, so you want to compute its wavelength coefficient. So what are you essentially doing? You're building a new tree. This is the average, and here are all the components that gives you the complementary information that you've lost if you just give the average. But what you want is to have information which are invariant. And to have information that is invariant, you need to pull down all these partial information to the bottom. How are you going to do it? You are going to take each of the branch of the tree, you are going to let them go down. So let me do it. This is the second way they transform that I apply to each coefficient. I push them down. Now these coefficients over there, I still need to push them down. So what am I going to do? Apply again a tree, a way they transform, to push them down. And I'm going to push everything down. And that's a convolution method. It's a convolution network just built with a wavelet transform that I tested. So, something important. There's two ways to see this network. One is to say, I applied a bunch of linear filter subsample. A linear filter L2 subsample like that. There is another way to view it. So that's that writing, factorization with linear filters. The other way is to observe, oh, this was a linear, this is linear because the nonlinearity disappears. It's useless to use a nonlinearity on a positive coefficient. So all the black tree is a single linear operator. I have a bigger linear operator embedded in this nonlinear transform, and I can use that as a factorization of these linear operators. And these are weighted transforms. So it's two different ways to see the same convolution tree. What is important is that these linear operators conserve the norm. So this operator here is going to preserve the norm, and here I'm using, whether it's a rectifier or a modulus, a nonlinearity, which is applied to the oscillating coefficient, it kills their sign, and here I apply it, but it doesn't do anything because this is positive. Okay. But a modulus or a rectifier is contracted. That means that you take two numbers, you take the absolute value, it's smaller than the absolute value of A minus B kill the phase, you bring back coefficients. If you do that on each of the coefficients of the transform, the distance is therefore going to be smaller than the distance between x minus y. So you have a contractive operator. The other thing is that you are going to preserve the norm because the modulus of a is equal to modulus of a, so you have a conservation. If you take the modulus, you don't change the energy. Now, all these coefficients that you produce at the bottom of the tree, you obtain them by cascading these contractive operators. Now, if you cascade contractive operators, so you contract, contract, contract distances, the result is going to be contracted. So, if you take this big vector and for two signal x and y, you just compute the Euclidean distance, you have a big feature vector, this is always going to be smaller than the Euclidean distance between x minus 1. So you have something stable. The second remarkable thing is that you preserve the energy. What does that mean? The energy of the signal has been transferred into totally invariant, translation invariant signal, which has exactly the same energy. But what we are really after, and that was our goal, is the stability to different and that's really the most important and subtle thing. If I take my signal, if I deform it, if I look in this domain, so if I look at the scattering vector, so why do I call it here scattering? It's because it's like a diffraction effect. You take your information, you explode it, you re-explode it, re-explode it, and so on, and progressively you have progressively more invariant information. If you look at it for the deformed signal, minus the result for the original signal, it's going to be of the order of the size of the deformation. And the key reason is that wavelets, when they are deformed, they remain similar to themselves, up to the size of the deformation. And what is even more, if you want to do this, you need to separate scales. So scale separation is very important if you want to linearize these deformations. What does it have to do with classification? So, 
these were uh, the first experiments, and that's the work of Joan uh, uh, Bonnard. So what about classification, for example, first on a simple problem like this. Why is it simple for us? Because this problem is just about translation variability and deformation variability. So what are we doing? We take X, we linearize the formation by going into the scattering domain, which is basically a convolution tree. And then you just do a simple linear classifier, and you get your results. And this linear classifier is going to project in different directions in order to be invariant to specific deformations, but not to other deformations. So this is a database of 60,000 uh, elements that was built by Yann Lequin with 50,000 element, elements for training. If you use a convolution network without data augmentation, the state of the art is about 0.4%. And if you do it with this scattering transform, you get about the same. Slightly better, but about the same. What is there to conclude? I, uh, I'll answer to your question. Let me just get the conclusion, I'll come to you. One remarkable thing. The convolution network didn't know the filter and learned it and learned it better. On the other hand, for this problem, you don't need to learn the filters because you know the group. And if you know the group and you want to be stable relatively to different modeling, you just know what they are. They are the windows. So you can just plug it by hand and you get the same result. The important thing is that if you don't have 60,000 samples, but much fewer samples, then it's very important not to learn because you don't have enough data uh, to learn from. Yes, you had a question. Oh, okay. So, that's the first. Now, these examples at this point are simple compared to what we are, people are really doing, and I'll come to more complicated. I would like now to go to problems of stochastic processes, textures. Sorry. So, yes? Just, just before, sorry. Yes? I think that the scattering thing is quite good because if we have less training samples, we can be more efficient. Yes. We have a single column saying if I have 500 samples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have this second column. Okay, uh, we have this second column. We, uh, that's in the paper, and, that, and then they get better. They, they, you have much better results when you have uh, very low. And in fact, the, the convolution network just don't work at all when you have something like 500 uh, uh, or 1,000. So, textures. Texture discrimination, this is a classification problem. This is one class, this is another class. What is more is you can view that as an unsupervised learning problem also. Can you learn the probability distribution of such a texture? What does it mean to linearize the problem in the framework of stochastic processes? To linearize the problem means take a stochastic distribution, which is extremely non-Gaussian, very long-range interaction, and make it Gaussian. Can you do that? So can we find a change of variable so that by miracle, the distribution, this is viewed as one point in your space, this point, these distributions are going to become Gaussian. If you can do that, it's wonderful because in the Gaussian space, everything is simple, uh, predictors are optimal, predictors are linear, everything is linear. The answer is yes, partly, and I'll explain that. Let's take example of this texture and first do classification. So this is a standard database, QRT from Berkeley of textures. So these are one class, a second class, a third class, and so on. Same classification problem than digits, okay? We're going to use exactly the same representation, scattering, linear classifier. The competitor here, the very standard classifier, which is not bad at all, are second order moments. In other words, Fourier spectrum. The Fourier spectrum do quite well. You have an error of about 1%. Where will it mess up? It will mess up whenever you have two textures which have exactly the same second order moment, but which are different because of higher order moment. They are going to distinguish, not to be able to distinguish. In this case, the scattering reduce the error by a factor of 5, which is here very important. Why? Because you can distinguish textures having exactly same second order moments. And I'm going to explain that. So let me one second go back to the mathematics. What is a texture? 
The texture is a stationary process, which has some form of ergodicity. So you have a random process, x indexed by t. t is the spatial variable here. What do you do if you do a scattering transform? You take your x and you do a convolution with a weight. If you do, you have a stationary process. You make a convolution, it remains stationary, because convolution is covariant to translation. If you take a modulus, it's still going to remain stationary. Convolution again is stationary, and so on. So all these things are stationary processes. But look, what do we do at the end? At the end, we average. So take a time series. If you average a stationary time series, you expect that it's going to converge to the mean if you have a little bit of decorrelation. So what you expect is that these averaging, when the averaging length goes to infinity, is going to converge because of the uh, uh, central, uh, central limit theorem, thank you, because of the central limit theorem. It's going to converge to the mean, and in fact it's going to get, converge to the Gaussian distribution centered at the mean, with a covariance matrix that goes to zero, okay? So, if you average enough, this is going to become a Gaussian process, and it's going to converge to this expected value. In some sense, what are we doing? We are characterizing textures with moments, very nonlinear moments, which are these moments. However, contrary to second or fourth order moments, these moments are contracted. If you take x and you compute x squared, this is not a contractive operation. x to the power of 4, it's even worse. And as a consequence, the variance of these estimators are huge. Here, because we contract, the variance goes to zero. And that's very important because we are going to be able to compute many moments without being affected by the covariance. And that's why we have this kind of estimation result. Now, I'm going to show you reconstruction, and all this is still the work of John Quigley. So, what are we going to do for the reconstruction? We want to reproduce a random process whose scattering transform has the same kind of Gaussian distribution. So, the way we're going to do it is that we begin with a random seed, and we try to find an x tilde such that with a gradient descent algorithm, which is going to reconstruct as closely as possible the scattering transform of x. So basically, we try to invert the network. It's not going to be an inversion in the sense that we are not going to recover a real x, but we're going to recover an x still that belongs to a similar family. I'm going to show you examples now. First in 1D, that was the original signal. You see, it's an audio texture. I'm going to make you listen to the audio texture, I just represent the spectrogram here, with a Gaussian model. So, you keep the covariance information, you reproduce a sound which has the same second order moment. You lose all the intermediacy, all the geometry. Now, same thing, which in some sense, you have a Gaussian process in this scattering domain reproduced from these moments. So you get the intermittency. This is a Gaussian paper. And in the scattering domain, you get the intermittency. That's a cocktail. A Gaussian cocktail. In the scatter. So obviously you don't reproduce the words, but you have the texture that is behind. Let me show you that on the image. This is an image of n pixels. If you were to compute the Gaussian process, because it's stationary, you need n moments, and you recover from n moments this kind of thing. With the scattering transform, you, the number of moments, because here you have log n factor, and here log n factor, are going to be much less of the order of log n squared. You get this. OK, it's about the same, so no big deal. This was near near Gaussian. This is an image which is much more structured. This is the Gaussian model. That's what you recover these log n squared moments. And you see that you recover the geometry. Why? Because you have the interaction between scale and orientation. So uh, Matthias Bench 
made uh, the lecture, he got very beautiful uh, results of reconstruction of textures from the network. The difference with his work here is that here we use much fewer moments than the covariance moment. He used much more, but he reproduced uh, much more complex and beautiful images. In these cases, we're just going to work with these very small number of moments to see how far we can go. This is a texture of rocks. That's what you get with the Gaussian model. That's what you get. Again, you see how the geometry is partly reproduced. Sparse signal, what the Gaussian model does it, and that's what you reproduce. Again, it's not the same, but it belongs to the same family. It's a similar texture, realization of a similar process. Turbulence. This is a 2D fluid turbulence. This is a Gaussian model. That's the Kolmogorov model. So it's a Gaussian process which has exactly the same power spectrum. And obviously, you destroy all the geometry of the filaments and so on. That's what you get if you reconstruct with these second order moments. What is very important here is that these coefficients, they give you the interactions across scale. The problems of many of the models we had been working with in the 90s is that when that coefficient gives you information about packets of frequency, they don't tell you how these frequency interact. And that's what the second order coefficient gives you, and they reproduce much more accurate models. So from there, you can do all kinds of things. This is a work that we did again with Joan, Yvon, Dokmanik, and Martin Deha. A very well known, yes. Because the wavelengths, they are indexed by a scale, okay? The scale varies like 2 to the j. If you have a signal of size n, how many scales you can have between 1 and n? So 2 to the j goes between 1 and n, how many scales do you have log n scale? And because you have two wavelengths, you have two log n parameters, you have log n squared parameters. It's the same argument that I was telling you at the beginning. You have d particles. If you take the interaction of all these possible d particles, you have d squared. If you group them, you are going to go to a log coefficient. And that's very strong dimension reduction. Yes? I'm curious if you, on the previous slide, maybe you tried to read also like third and fourth moment to see how much to learn. To learn also third and fourth moments of this company. Okay, so third and fourth moment. That's an idea that the whole signal processing community obviously had and studied in the 90s and died. Why did it die? Because you can get beautiful theorem, but you cannot estimate these moments. Because the variance you have on these moments is huge. So you need thousands of images to estimate a force of the moment. That's the problem. In these cases, I have a single image. And from a single image, I need to gather my statistics so I need to have estimators with very small bodies. And that's the problem. So you just can't do the computations uh, of that. So let me show you the easing model. The easing easy model is a model for ferromagnetism. You have the spins of a metal that can be either positive or negative orientation, which is white or black. And if you look at the distribution of these spins, they are going to follow a Gibbs energy, which is given by this bilinear function. If you change the temperature, so beta is the inverse of temperature, very hot environment, very cold environment, then the spins are going to be completely random. And if you lower down the temperature, the spin is going to organize, and you are going to have regions of uh, aggregations of spins following this law. So this is the so-called easing process as a function of the inverse temperature parameter. What you would like to know, this is an obviously extremely long Gaussian. Can you reproduce that without knowing even that you are binary? Okay. So you just compute. So with the Gaussian process is a disaster, I won't show. With the scattering, these are the random processes reproduced with scattering print. So it's like doing a decomposition of this Gibbs energy, but on a multi-scale 
uh, behavior, and you get models for any temperature which are very reasonable. Now, we are going to do an inverse problem. Suppose you make just a very brutal average. So I average this information over a square. That's what you get. This information average over a square. That's what you get, or this one, okay? And I want to do an inverse problem. What I know is this, and I also know a statistical model or some prior. And I want to inverse, get back this from this. If you regularize your problem with, let's say, a total variation norm, which is often done because this is piecewise constant, so you may think, okay, piecewise constant model, uh, let's minimize the total variation. That's what you get. You get back a piecewise constant model, and which is the equivalent of this. Let's now do the same kind of thing by imposing the fact that we know the scattering coefficient, just average, okay, and then do a prediction of the original images. And that's what you get. And what you can see is that there is a lot of similarities now. It's much better than these models. However, if you compute the L2 distance between this and this, it's not good. It's not good because you don't master translation parameters. You recover something which has the same statistics and which has the basically same local properties. But that's what you need in many inverse problems, such as geophysics or, uh, yeah, in particular, we're uh, thinking of geophysics or X ray tomography. So it's a different way to look at inverse problems. And that's again uh, a work also that was derived by, uh, from the previous work of Joan. And the main reason is that you have new stochastic models of data that goes beyond what people have. So that's to show that these deep nets are producing new mathematical models. We are not in a situation where you work and you ask to your mathematician friend, oh, do you have a tool to explain what I'm doing? No. You work, you have a new phenomena, and then you go to your mathematical friend and you say, look, work out because what you have doesn't work. And that's what makes things difficult, is that we are really in a domain where the mathematics hasn't yet been developed. Okay, so what we've been working with are these convolution trees. And the question we ask, so there is a number of successes that we've seen. The question we ask is, is there any limitation to the fact that we don't make any uh, communication? So let me now go on the dark side of the problem. This is a texture recognition problem. Same than previously, but the textures are also rotated very strongly. Here are four classes. You do a scattering transform with just convolution in space. And you have only 20 examples per class, okay? The area is huge, 20% there. What goes wrong? What do you think? <coughs> the problem is, the group we're dealing with is not where there is a huge variation. It's not anymore the translation group. It's the rotation group. So now we have to deal with this rotation group. And that's the problem. So, We'll do a three minute pause and then we'll resume.
Yes. But uh, so that's yeah. a very unique yeah. way of having it. But this is, you know, all the things that are going to depend on the strip plan. All these linear points don't work. They're just a community test. Luckily, there is no way to do this with a single linear point, whatever mm. well it will be fine. Because of the environment. Do the operation you want to have some special fire to have it.
Yeah. Okay, I would like to come back to one question that was asked during the post that is really important at Seattle. Is the difference between covariance and invariance? And why do we need one and the other? So invariant representation. It's a representation. So when you have a why do we want invariant representation? Because we want to reduce dimensionality. And environment means that we are killing variables, sources of variability. So that's good. But obviously, you want an environment which corresponds to the type of environments that your function has. So many functions, classification functions, are, let's say, environment to translation. What does that mean? That means that you want to build a representation such that if x is translated, the representation of x, which I call here phi x, is the same than the representation of x translated. A covariant representation is something different. A covariant representation is a representation such as if x is translated, if I build a representation of x which still depends, let's say, upon time, the representation is going to be translated. So one thing that you can prove is that if you want to have something which is covariant and linear, then it has to be a convolution. It is equivalent to say that this representation has to be a convolution with some filter like that. So linear covariant representations are convolution. This is why we see convolution. Now you may ask, yeah, but if we want something which is invariant, why do we care about covariant representation? For the following reason. If you want to have a representation which is invariant and obtained with just a time averaging from something which is nonlinear, so you want this to be invariant to translation, but you want that this invariant is obtained by an average, then you need that the intermediate representation so that's the middle layer of the network, let's say. They need to be covariant. So an invariant obtained by an averaging is valid if you are averaging something which is covariant. This is why intermediate layers need to be covariant, even though the final layers after the proper averaging will be invariant. So that's a confusing but important element. We are constantly playing with 
operators which are covariant, so that at the end we have something which is invariant by just a linear average. Now, the other important thing to remember, covariant plus linear implies filter convolution. Now, let's go to this problem. In this problem, we are now dealing with rotation. And what I'm going to show is that one of the beauty of these connections across channels is that they will allow us to build environments, covariance, and environments to essentially any type of groups that we are interested in. And let's begin with rotation. Look what's happened. What did we do when we applied these filters? We had filters that were indexed by scales, the wavelength, and indexed by rotation. So we created a new variable, which is this rotation variable. Up to now, we just did convolution in space. But if we now want to have something which is in to rotation, we need to work along the rotation variable. So we will need to make convolution along this rotation bar. And that's the key idea. So, look at... Okay, so now we are not anymore dealing with the group of translation, but we are dealing with the group of translation and rotation. In other words, it's the group of rigid mo uh, movement. The main difference between translation group and groups of rigid movements is that the group of rigid movements is not commutative anymore. Translation rotation followed by another translation rotation, they don't go because of the rotation effect on the group translation. Okay, let's take, begin with the way they transform. At the beginning, you don't have the choice. The only variable that you have is the translation variable. So you can only act on this translation variable. So you're going to do convolution on your translation variable and basically do a wavelet type transform. Okay, that's the first stage because that's the only thing that you have in but, what if the translation variable is translated and rotated? What's going to happen on the wavelet coefficients? The wavelet coefficients are going to be translated and rotated. But the wavelet coefficient was seen with a wavelet that was looking with the direction theta. And what's happening to theta is that what was previously viewed with the direction theta is now viewed in the direction theta minus alpha because of the rotation. So you have a translation effect along the rotation bar. If you want to be a rotation environment, you need to kill these effects. So, to do that, we need to build an operator which is covariant but not to translation, to both translation and rotation. So now, we have our functions which are now dependent on the translation and the rotation variable which has been created by the wavelength. A convolution on the group of translation rotation is basically a convolution along the group of translation. But also, you have a convolution along the rotation variable. And we are basically going to create wavelets but now in this 3D space, and that's the work of Laurent Stiffre, along the 2D variable of translations, this is the 2D wavelet, but which is also going to be modulated by the 1D wavelet along the rotation variable. And if you look at the product on the group structure, you get a wavelet which turns like that. This is the wavelet on the group. So it looks complicated, but just think it's a wavelet. Okay, I don't care. It's something which is localized, and it's a convolution on a different group, but it's still a convolution. Now, how will the scattering transform behave? It will be formally the same thing. And that's where mathematics begins to be useful. Because if you think in terms of all the details of the parameters, you get lost. If you go at one layer up, it's not too complicated. It's just a cascade of convolution and averaging. Here, the convolution is done along the translation group, the averaging. And obviously, the integral is environed by translation rotation, it's the average. You get an intermediate now layer which is covariant to translation rotation. 
because it's covariant, if you integrate it along translation rotation, you get an invariant to translation and to rotation. You want the next layer which is also covariant to translation rotation. So it has to be a convolution along the translation and rotation group. That's your wavelet. You want to build an invariant. You take the modulus and you're going to integrate and you cascade. So you just put wavelets, but now wavelets on a different group, which is a bit big. If you do that, and that's again the work of Laurent C, the air drops down from 20% to 0.6% for your texture classification, because you got the right group. Okay? Again, here we don't learn the network. We know the network because we know the group. So we know how to build up the filter, and we just put the filter inside. And we don't have so much choice again. They have to be multi-scale if you want to be stable and linearize the deformation. So I'm going to show an application of that to physics and to n-body problem. And that's the work that was done by Nicolas Poilbert, who was a postdoc and physicist, and Matthew Herr, who was also a postdoc uh, mathematician. So X now is the state of the physical system. So, in quantum chemistry, it's going to be given by the position of each atom in the molecule and by the number of electrons of each atom. So, if it's uh, depending uh, hydrogen, oxygen, it's going to be eight and so on. Now, what you want to compute is the energy of the system, and therefore in this case of the molecule, where the molecule is at rest. So, Kahn and Cham, they got the Nobel Prize for discovering the following thing. You have an n-body problem. So, you, n is the number of electrons, very large. You need to solve the Schrodinger equation with thousands of variables. Impossible. The number of, it's huge numerical problem. They reduce the problem by finding that you can create an equivalent variable what is this equivalent variable? It's the electronic density. I'm going to show you what is an electronic density. This is what is the electronic density. You have your molecule, and what I'm showing you is the probability of the appearance of an electron at a given position. So most electrons are concentrated near the nuclei, but they are also delocalized between the atoms because this is what defines the chemical glue. That what makes all the chemical reaction and the fact that the molecule stays together. So the electrons are also delocalized and that's their, prob their density probability. So the total energy of the molecule is a function of this electronic density. You have different terms and that's the physics I'm not describing. The energy due to the velocity of the electron, the fact that the electron and the nuclei are attracted, so you have a Coulomb term. The electrons are also have a repulsive forces because they have the same negative charges. And then you have this exchange correlated energy, which is the horrible bag where you put all the quantum effects. Okay. What they prove is that if you have this exchange correlation energy and you find the row which minimizes this energy, you are going to get effectively the right energy at rest and the right density. Now, last thing, something very important. This f of x, what are its symmetries? If the molecule is rotated, the energy doesn't change. If the molecule is slightly deformed, the energy is going to change smoothly. So basically, you have an image processing problem. Same kind of environment than for an image classification problem. Okay, now, it depends upon this variable, and this variable can be viewed as the Euclidean embedding. Yes? Okay, x is, view x as letters. x gives you H2O, that you have two hydrogen, one oxygen, and that O corresponds to eight electrons, H to uh, one electron, and you know their position. So it's just a series of numbers. 
It's like in language, it would be the letters. Now you take these letters and if you do Euclidean embedding, you want to represent it by a vector in a Euclidean space. Rho is the electronic density which represents x, which lives, this is a function of R2 or R3, okay? But the rho of, at low uh, minimum energy represents really the exact density. Now, what we're going to do is a very naive embedding. We don't know this rho because that would require to solve Schrodinger equation. What we're just going to do is represent the molecule by small Gaussians, where the amplitude of the Gaussian at the right location is proportional to the number of electrons. So you just represent it by a set of peaks like that. Okay, blocks. And now we are going to represent, build a representation from this embedding as a sum of Gaussians, which needs to have the pro appropriate properties. Invariant rotation, stability to, to deformation. So what people in physics began to do when they began to be interested in learning, try Fourier, because Fourier is invariant to translation. You can make it invariant to rotation. But the problem is that you don't have the stability to do it. We're going to do the same thing with scattering. Now, you're going to have a big family of scattering coefficients. What we're going to do is to try to make a regression of our function. So now it's a regression problem. That means the function has real value. It's an energy. As a linear combination of the scattering coefficients, but we're just going to try to pick the appropriate scattering so we are going to do sparse regression with a kind of L1 uh, uh, regression. So we want to have something as sparse as possible. We are going to make it with M coefficient, and we'll see what happens when M increases. What are the WK? In physics, this would be called the equivalent potential. It's the linear combination of the energy. These are the weights, and the physics is there. <coughs> Learning these weights. Okay. What does it do? This is the molecule, this is the wavelet transform of the molecule. You can see very redundant. You send a wave, small wave, on your atom, that's what you get for different orientation of waves, different, uh, different uh, orientation, different scales. Now, you want to make an average, but if you make an average, you need to recover the lost information, so you're going to send a second wave, different scale, different orientation. But you also want to have something in variant for rotations. So you need to send a third wave along rotations. That's the rototranslation. And you'll get then the joint between the two, modulus and average. Okay, what's the result? This is a database that was put together by physicists with 4,000 molecules. 4,000 molecules, very small. You have no chance of computing a deep network with 4,000 examples. Okay, it's a very small amount of data. So, we're going to do a regression. Okay, we have one, uh, half of the module for tests, half for training, and that's the error as the number of term increases. At one point, if you do a regression with too many terms, the variance increases, the, re the, the error uh, gets worse. With the Fourier algorithm regression, you get an error that stops about 40 kilocalorie per mole. So that's essentially a, a numerical algorithm. If you do a si numerical simulation with, with the property of Schrodinger, you get an error between 1 and 2 kilocalorie per mole. So that's about 10 times bigger. And so that's very bad. If you do the same thing with the scattering coefficient, the error goes down to about, you know, now about 1.6 or 1.8 kilocalorie per mole. So much lower. And you get something which is of the same order of error as what you would have done if you had done a numerical simulation knowing the Schrodinger equation. But here we know nothing. So it's just a different way to learn physics. It's a different way. Uh, yes, question. Just uh, say this is a very generic question. Between the idea of position physics or mass or something that you can interpret and these modes. So this is great, and we can actually try to understand what's going on because we have a previous model. Um, but if we try to use this in a completely new stuff, 
don't know anything, okay, we obtain great results, but we don't know what's going on. Exactly, you're perfectly, and that's why physics is interesting. Because, on the one hand, you have the physical equations. So you can analyze the property of the FFX. On the other hand, you needed expansion. And what you would like is exactly what you said, is to be able to relate the two. How come this thing was able to regress that kind of function? And one of the things that appears to be very important, okay, everybody knows that if you want to solve Schrodinger, it's a good idea to do scale separations on big systems. No big deal. What is interesting here is that you are com computing the interaction terms. If you look at the first 10 terms that comes here, they are all interaction terms. And in fact, they're always the same. How does that relate to the geometry? How does that relate to Schrodinger? We don't know. The mathematics is difficult, but that's a very interesting problem. Let me say something else. Be careful. The regression is going to be good here because we are staying within the range of this data. If I give you a metal uh, molecule and I train on uh, biological chemical, uh, organic molecule, you see my level of chemistry, my uh, organic molecule have no chance because you are just outside the range of the regression ability. So there is no miracle. But I would like to do a small remark. This way to learn physics is not new. Think, I, and there is an example I like, is you know this small fish that goes in the vase in, in the very dark oceans, uh, anguilla, very elongated like that. They produce electric, and they can't see because you can't see. So what they do is they produce an electric field. The electric field is affected by the environment. They have electric sens uh, sensors on their bodies. They measure the deformation of the electric field, and they can compute exactly their environment. We know it because you can do tests. Okay. The problem they are solving is simply an inverse electromagnetic problem that you can solve with you have, if you want to pose the equation. You have the Maxwell equation, and you solve the inverse problem. So people try to do this. We are much worse than the only, but really much worse. And the only doesn't have the equation. I mean, as far as I know, they didn't have Maxwell in their ancestors. But they solve it, so they must be able to get the physics, because there's the only way to solve the problem is to invert the physics. Okay? It's just a different way to learn the physics. Probably the way Biondi goes, I don't know, but if you, well, that kind of thing is that, uh, first of all, they have their uh, genes, but also if they make a mistake and then they go nearby the object, they realize they have their mistake and then they can update and so on. So one can imagine, I will answer to think that Biondi do something much closer to machine learning than going to fundamental equations have to see that fundamental equations are wonderful, but the day you take the fundamental equation and you try to solve a large size system, then analyze the property of uh, uh, a material with millions of particles, it's horribly difficult. We don't know. Sorry, you had a question. Uh, yeah, two points with respect to your comparison theory. Um, one, I don't think it's fair to say that that's the same of the art. The state of the art is here. The state of the art, sorry, you're absolutely sorry. There is a whole community, and the state of the art was Coulomb kernel methods that are, I'm sorry, you're, you're right to, to point it out, that I'm showing that's in the publication, that we're getting about six kilocalorie per mole, uh, five, six, and uh, that's in much better than four. That was the first thing that people tried. Coulomb, I won't go into it, it's a kernel method, but, and that's where it was. But, the other point is just that if you want to show the difference, um, you talk a lot about how it's like, you know, the important point is being stable to deformations and things. So maybe looking rather than the equilibrium energy between S and you might see a bigger gap between the very ranges. That's what we are uh, doing. Now, the problem is two things. First of all, I should have said, we dealt with planar molecule. We dealt with planar molecule because we had software and image processing. The first thing was to go to 3D. Now, we are able to reproduce 3D, but that's much bigger software. And the next thing you are absolutely right is to go to the Haitian. 
because you have something stable and to demonstrate that it's okay. And that's still not. This is really ongoing research. So we'll see how far it can go. There was another question. Okay, so I will continue. Okay, I would like to point out, oh, and I should say, there is nowadays a whole community, very interesting community, that is being created between people coming from physics, theoretical physics, chemistry, learning, mathematics, which are trying to understand what can we do on learning and uh, physics. There is a special semester at IPAM in uh, Los Angeles, just on that, that is being on beginning in September. This is a very fascinating uh, domain, as I said, because if you try to recognize cats and dogs, you have a lot of data, but nobody knows the functional of a dog or the functional of a cat, whereas in physics you know the functional. So it's a case where the mathematics are <coughs> easier to follow. Now, I would like to come back to audio. In audio, as I said, the when you have time, but you are also creating a new axis, which is frequency. When you build up an audio picture, as I showed, you're not just going to get time deformation, but also frequency deformation. So you don't want to just work exactly like what we initially did work in a rotation. You don't want just to work on time translation deformation, but also frequency translation rotation. This is transposition. That's what will happen when you go, let's say, to a female, to a higher uh, male voice, or if you do a frequency transposition in music. So the group will be a time frequency group of translation rotation, Heisenberg. As a consequence, the wavelet is not just going to be a time wavelet as we did initially, you also want to do it as a frequency dependent wavelet, and you are going to get two dimensional wavelet as if it was an image. Okay? So we're going to deal with that with a convolution of this thing, both with function of time and frequency, which are these products of wavelengths. Okay? So we are now dealing with a group which is the Heisenberg group. And each time, we are going to do the averaging just in time. Okay? Because we want to have structures which are involved. If you think of music, music we are sensitive to structure up to several minutes. This is the subtlety of the interpretation which will give you the movement of uh, a musical piece, so it can go to potentially very large uh, scale. Let me show you why, in fact, it's very important. I'm going to make you, I, I showed you until now, just successes. This is the bias of the researcher. So now I'm going to show you the failures, okay? And obviously, the, the researcher shows you the failure only when he has a solution to the failure. So that's a, that's a, Maybe the solution is not perfect. Okay. Okay, cello, going on. This is now the time scattering transform. He considers that as a stationary process. Okay, there is really no beginning, no end. And that's what it reproduces. It looks a bit like that, but here. There is no real sense of direction in this. To get a sense of direction, you need to explicitly, in some sense, carry this geometry. Okay? And I'm going to make you hear the synthesis obtained from the joint time and frequency transform. And this is the work of Joachim and then and Vincent Rustel. You hear that not perfect, the timber is not perfect. We don't know if it's convergence or just because we are missing some other structure groups. Let me hear you something else. She had a duck suit and crazy wash for all year. Okay, scattering transform of this very structure. What's happening? You mix completely because it's time environment. All the harmonic lines and some are there, some are there because you didn't respect the 2D structure. You want to respect this 2D structure to reproduce it. And therefore, you need to live in the plane. That's what you do when you have the time and frequency joint transform. Better. Not perfect. But much better. Obviously, that was the first variable that was missing. But it's obviously not enough. Just to show you, we need 
to gather the structure and there is not just time. Let me show you classification. So this is a database of instruments. So you have, for example, a clarinet, electric music. Okay, that's the image. And so on. Okay, what's happening is, so obviously you have many examples and as it form it gets complicated. So, what were the standard descriptors used for the one who knows the field? They were MFCC. On this database, the error was about uh, 0.4, so 14% uh, of errors, so it's quite high. Basically, what it computes is local descriptor at the scale of 25 milliseconds. If you just do a scattering in time, you don't do much better. Why? Because a lot of structure is really a 2D structure. If you do a convolution net, this is done by the authors, the convolution net in this case doesn't do much better. Why? Because you have few samples per class. You don't have so many, and maybe also the guys who did it were not uh, used to get the best. You have to realize, when you attack on a new problem with a convolution net, just expect that you'll spend the next one year of your life optimizing the convolution net, unless it's a very similar problem than a network that was already solved, and then you can take the previous structure and update it. Okay? But if you don't, so probably he didn't spend one year of his life, and therefore he does it. He tries hard, and there's your point for you. But also, you don't have many examples, so that could be one. And that's what you get with the time frequency scattering. And there is a huge jump. Zero point, uh, the error goes to 0 0.80. And in this case, it's because you see, the structure is obviously completely uh, two-dimensional. The problem is hard because many sounds look alike, and also because you don't have so many examples. That's the second example are environmental sounds. So I let you recognize that was not the air conditioning. This is some of the uh, uh, cars. Children playing. Dog barking. And so on. Okay, these, and there are many like them. Okay, eight, ten classes, eight thousand classes, so about one thousand examples per class. Okay, that, and these are very big signals. It's not like CIFAR 900 uh, sample, very big. So you don't have any uh, example. Same thing, MFCC got 0 0.4, time scattering, in this case, is much quite better, 0 0.27. ConfNet, optimized by the author who uh, did the publication, was at an error of, it was about the same. Again, because you don't have so many the time frequency scattering gets you uh, a little, well, a drop, significant drop, let's say, because again, it's two dimensional and it, it gets you right now the, the state of the art. So it's just to say, when the problem, you have some prior, and the number of examples that you have is not so large, you may not be in a situation to compute a convolution network. And in that kind of case, why not using the prior information that you have? You know the type of filters that you need to put, which are basically wavelets on the groups, you cascade them, and so on. Now, does that get you the state of the art of the world? No, very far from it. Okay, I, I want to insist on that. Complex image classification problem. So that's the work by Eduard Oyer. Same thing, so you have, I go back to these problems of classification, you have images and labels, okay, and you want to find whether it's a tree, an anchor, and so on. So, we are going to do a scattering on the Rutlow translation group, okay, supervise and regression. Now, what do you get? You get an error, so that was on C4, of about 20%, so 80% accuracy. That's the best that you can get, basically, with all unsupervised methods. So, unsupervised methods are methods that learn the representation 
from unlabeled data and then essentially do a simple linear classifier at the end. In our case, we don't learn the representation from the data. We just put priors because we know the groups. And you get the same level of uh, as the best of these methods. The advantage is that the representation doesn't change for different problems. They are always the same, same software gets the same result. Now, if you use the data to learn the representation with DeepNet, you get errors of the order of 7%, three times better. The gap is huge. So there, obviously, DeepNet do much better. Obviously, they learn much more structure than just these geometrical groups. And that's now the mystery. What is the nature of these environments that they are able to build in order to reduce the dimensionality, so the, the kind of groups that are uh, behind, these are open problems. And that goes back to my slide that I showed you. There is something very amazing in these results, that they are able to linearize phenomena which are completely non-geometrical groups, completely adapted to the data. And how do they do that? What's the nature of the group? You have to realize, you can't do that on any arbitrary groups. The world of groups is absolutely huge. Obviously, these things have a limited learning capacity, and obviously they exploit the appropriate structures. Okay, so if I come back, in order to conclude, to the structure, the difficulty to analyze that, when you go back to the full generality of the deep network, is that these linear operators have many roles simultaneously. The nonlinearity is simple. In some sense, you can view as a linear operator as making the appropriate rotation of the space in order to present it to the nonlinearity so that the nonlinearity does its effect appropriately. The linear operators are dealing with the symmetry in order to linearize this nonlinear transform. At the same time, once the linear, this nonlinear transform has been linearized, you need to build an environment with a projector. The linear operator will also do it. They will project, kill what can be killed because linearized from the previous layer. There is also a memory function. When you do reconstruction, there is these very nice examples, I don't know if you've seen them, of a deep network dream, where people from Google had been randomly modifying some of the coefficients. And in the reconstructed images, you see an elephant in the sky and some other structures appearing all over. What does that mean? That means that these networks have memory, because when you modify coefficients, you don't have a random coefficient coming out, but the whole structure. Which is not surprising, because behind these linear operators, you need to capture some essential properties of the data, you could see from a one-dimensional vector, you could reproduce a whole face. All this needs to be understood in a single framework, separated these roles, which are all embedded in the same linear operator. So I tried here to summarize the open problems, uh, difficult open problems that I see. The first thing, I said, OK, there are groups behind. If you give me the groups, I can build the filters and the operators. What about the inverse? If you give me the operators, because the network has been learned, can we recover the underlying groups relatively to which these operators have been built? Can we, are these operators building some kind of wavelet transform on the group? Or are they doing something completely different? First question. Now, as I said, you are not going to build any kind of group. The set of groups you can deal with will have to be very limited because you have very limited amount of data. What are the classes of groups that you can learn from these things? Now, what is our goal? Our goal is to approximate a function. Okay, now, what is the underlying regularity? What is the functional class that you can learn from these structures? What does it mean? 
It, what, again, to come back to what I said in the previous lecture, I'm not interested when m goes to infinity to have an error that goes to zero. This is easy. Any technique will give you that to begin with a single basis. What you want is to have a representation such that when you have n parameter, the error decays very fast as a function of m, so that with a limited amount of data, you can learn. So, fast approximation rate. What are the class of functions that can be approximated with a fast approximation rate with that kind of structure? And this is a very difficult problem. All the functional spaces that are usually used in a functional analysis, they are a function of two, three variables. Here we are speaking of function of a million variables, or even a functional, a function of a function. So, can we define these classes of high-dimensional regular functions that are well approximated? Can we get approximation theorems? In other words, can we get the rates of decay depending upon the index of the space? That's what approximation theory is doing. Depending upon what space, I get the fast of decay. This is the theory that we all need to build up. I'm sure it's going to be built up. But it will take time. It will take time because, again, the underlying problems are really difficult to realize that. Go back to turbulence. Turbulence is just one particular class of functions, the function that creates this turbulent fluid. Quantum chemistry, these are the type of function we are dealing with. So we, we shouldn't expect to solve this problem within the next three years. That's, but there is a lot of intermediate results that can be. Let me conclude. Okay, so, conclusion. There are, and I want to insist on that, this is not a fake, this is not a fashion. There are very spectacular results that have been obtained by these details. It is very amazing. Right now, again, the field is completely experimental, and that's normal. This field which would have, would have never been built if people hadn't concentrated on the experimental aspect because the maths are difficult and are very non-intuitive. Mathematicians would never have that kind of idea. So it's good, and that's giving us work, so we should be happy about it. Uh, there are a number of observations. Obviously, these things compute your article environment, so we need some kind of theory of the article environment. Harmonic analysis is going to be all over, and it is all over because you have filters. Wave that comes in, maybe some other type of transform. I think that scale separation is very fundamental here. We can't avoid it, and we see it all over. Physics, biology, even the hierarchy. You take a text, you have a paragraph, you have a chapter, you have words. All these are hierarchical structures, okay? So it's also very important for physiology and audition. There is, in fact, a lot of models coming out from audition, coming out from physiology, which points in these directions. And now there is a lot of cross characterization Concerning wavelengths, since the 60s, 70s, we know that in V1, the visual cortex, the simple cells, in a first approximation, behave like wavelet filters with different orientation. We know that in the cochlea, in the ear, the pressure waves arrived is filtered with a Q-constant filter bank, which is a wavelet type transfer. So the question that we're asked in the 80s were, why these wavelets were around? The answer at the time we had was compression, because wavelets are good to build a sparse representation compression, so probably it's good to compress to then process. But deep down, we don't care about compression. What we really care is about recognition. In what sense it's different? You can compress and build up a representation which is impossible, totally unstable for recognition. And in fact, if you take JPEG, JPEG 2000, and try to do image recognition from JPEG or JPEG 2000, the best thing you can do is invert JPEG and then begin to work, okay? because it's a very unstable. So there is probably other reason, and maybe in environments. Close link with physics. Particle physics is entirely based on the analysis of groups, symmetry, so we should see a convergence of these fields. A lot of math has been developed in that framework. And there are some close links, as I said, in statistical physics I showed 
the Eisen model. And as a last word, there are really other outstanding problems. I just described a way to think, phrase out the problem. But again, not the solution, mathematical solution of the problem. Mathematical solution would require to know the notion of complexity, regularity, approximation theorem, functional classes. I didn't describe any of these. All this is very old. And that's, again, the paper which basically summarized uh, uh, a lot of these ideas. Thanks very much. Uh, for me, okay, so there you're asking me, then it's going to be a completely biased answer. <laughs> Invert the problem. And obviously, and the answer is I'm working on that, but I, we are far from that, and there are many different ideas that can be tried. In other words, get the matrices, and can you recover the group? And I'm going to say a word. Do you need to structure? Right now, these networks are very, not very structured. We don't impose so much there. Can you structure the network to make it easier to get these matrices to these groups and maybe learn faster? So, the inverse problem. That's at least one question. And I have a tendency to recommend, you know, when you begin to attack that kind of problem and you have a math background, you look at the problem or physics background, immediately react and say, oh, these people, they don't know what they are doing. I'm going to build out a new algorithm which does much better. You spend the next year, it's useful to do that, just to realize that it's not gonna work. And then you come back to the thing. Don't spend too much time on that aspect. Go back to what people do, put the hand in the mud, see how these algorithms work, and then you have to use your physics or math background to try to build up the model. But I really strongly recommend to work with the way these network work because there has been a huge amount of work to make them work. And it's very hard. The day you try something else, very hard. So that's what I would consider as a first step. Also, I should say, maybe it's not the right way to do the problem. Okay, maybe, uh, obviously, you can always say there's groups behind, because there is a symmetric group, you have a problem, there is a symmetric, but maybe it's not the right mathematical object. The only reason why I have a tendency to believe that it's the right mathematical object is because for wavelets, for all these problems, it worked with just one, two, or three groups, you got the whole thing. So very simple description. But that still has to be proved. Yes? Okay, the answer is no, and I would like to elaborate a little bit on this now. The case of text analysis is very interesting, because basically the theory of text analysis is linked, given normally by linguistic, Chomsky, grammars, lexic. So the way people have been viewing the world is through grammars, and the equivalent of grammars is chemistry, okay? You have rules to put things together, and to explore the set of possible through that. And we know that for text analysis, it was a kind of fame. And Google does much better based, and probably Facebook as well, and so on, based on this kind of deep networks. Now, we obviously, grammar exists. It's a structure that it exists. What's the relation between this network and the underlying grammar? What people report is that this network can capture grammar. In other words, closing parentheses and so on. So these are slightly different types of network. They're still convolutional, but these are the recurrent or LSTM network. And there will be, in fact, a, a poster by Mathieu Andreu on relation between wavelets and recursive networks and so on. Uh, we, we, uh, he's beginning to, to work on that. There are relations, but many open problems again. Now, but all this to say, we don't know. And if you think of language, you won't think of language in terms of groups, but grammar. 
and grammars are not groups. So the connection is not obvious. As you go down, and also uh, John helped it work uh, on this, is you see a group, you can factorize it, your big symmetric group that you can partly capture. Okay, first you have rotation. So it's going to be, let's say, in two dimensional R squared. And then let's say you have, that's translation, sorry, rotation. And then you can introduce a third group that we call G3, and a fourth group, and so on. So you progressively build up your group. And this building up is the first layer just gives you translation, because the image is indexed by a translation bar. Then you build up your wavelet with a uh, rotation translation bar. And then you can create a new group. And that's a little bit exposed in this uh, paper. So the idea is that you can view the different layers as each time introducing new groups, which still propagates to the deeper layer because of the covariance. That's why you need covariance to propagate the whole group. But that's what you do with the covariance. But when you go the other way around, I'm sure I'm guessing that some layer might be mixing with other layers. Okay, but if you mix several groups, you have one group, which is the product of the two. You can always consider the... the because if you mix the two, that means that you're considering, the, the, in some sense, the generators of the two. You have a bigger group, and that's what is being said by that. You have a group, you mix a new group, which is a rotation group with a translation group, and you get the roto-translation group, which is this one. And then you mix something else, and you get a bigger group and a bigger group. You just incorporate new generators if you think in the algebra terms. Yes. What tools do you use to experiment at micro level? At micro level, you mean? Like, um, first thing you said, okay, let's just use one filter to process one image and then see what we can process that. Before you open the experiment to all this um, deeply theoretical network, what do you use to? I'm sorry, I didn't understand uh, the question. Is there a way to experiment at high level, micro level, so that you understand that you can pose this model before you create a huge Okay, yes, I understand. Uh, so, you, I, I, I'm not sure I, I mean, if you. Okay, and that's the whole problem. That, it's, that's where you are asking the root of the problem. You cannot look at the global network and say, I hope I'm going to uh, extract the global groups or things like that. You have to decompose so that you can extract, at, as you said, a micro level. And for doing this, I have a tendency to believe that you need to structure the network. The way the networks are defined is to have the fastest computation, easiest implementation, which doesn't mean the easiest mathematics. So we need to make the mathematics a little bit easier. And in particular, you've observed all the ways that are complex. Why are they complex? Because you have a notion of phase. And the phase, you kill it with the modulus, but the phase carries a lot of information about the group. So, uh, they were networks that were put together by Tiger, John, and some that were complex. And that's the kind of thing we are now doing. Working with complex networks and trying to analyze the phase to try to derive from the variation of the phase, so at the micro level, the properties of the groups. These are the kind of things that we're trying to do. I don't know if I, but, but that's the whole math problem. How to simplify 
the problem so that the groups comes out as a simple micro element.